For more than 20 years, the Riverside County Department of Waste Resources has been teaching residents how to turn green waste, like grass clippings and leaves, into compost, a product that's beneficial for yards and gardens. In addition to this video presentation, every year the department holds nearly two dozen backyard composting classes at a variety of locations across the county if you'd like to learn the basics about composting in person. At each of the classes and at our headquarters in Moreno Valley, the department has geo bins available for purchase by Riverside County residents. The bins are only $12 each because most of their cost is subsidized from tipping fees paid at the landfills. The geo bins are an excellent option for home composting, but you can also use other bins purchased at a store, construct your own bin using plans available on the CalRecycle website, or opt to not use a bin at all and make a compost pile. Whichever option you choose, a compost bin or pile should be between 3x3x3 three by three by three feet to 5x5x5 five by five by five feet to allow for ease of turning. Anything larger can be hard to turn and time-consuming, while anything smaller will not generate or maintain the heat required and will take longer to break down. There are several advantages to using a bin instead of a pile. A bin contains the compost material and keeps it from spreading out, while aiding in the heating process. In addition, there's less water loss with a bin. So once you've decided on making a bin or a pile, where do you put it? Most importantly, it has to be convenient and comfortable for you. Here in Riverside County, that will likely be in the shade. You'll also want it close to a water source or reachable by hose. Compost must have direct contact with soil, so don't put it on concrete or gravel. Lastly, choose a location that allows for a composting area that's twice the size of the bin or pile so that you can easily turn the material and work it from different angles. Now that we've picked out the location, what kind of compost do we want? There are two kinds, anaerobic and aerobic. Which one you choose depends on how much work you want to put in and how long you're willing to wait for finished compost. Option one is anaerobic. You simply let nature run its course by layering material. There's no turning needed, but as a result, the compost doesn't heat up and takes longer to break down, more than six months in some cases. Anaerobic piles can have an odor associated with them, but they don't need to be watered. On the other hand, aerobic compost requires a bit more attention, but there's a much faster return, 10 to 12 weeks instead of six months. So now that we know a bit more about the different types of compost bins or piles, what goes into it? Let's start with brown material. It can be leaves, twigs, cardboard, newspaper, napkins, paper towels, dryer lint, and sawdust. Items that are dry, high in carbon, and slow to decompose. Essentially dead materials where all the nitrogen has been depleted. You can certainly use all of those materials, but it's worth noting the best place for most paper products is your curbside recycle bin. Brown material needs to make up 50% of the compost by volume, not weight. In addition, for the quickest compost, brown materials should be no thicker than your little finger and no longer than six inches in length. Then there's green material, essentially the opposite of brown material. Green material is fresh, high in nitrogen, and fast to decompose. Grass clippings, flowers, manure, food waste, and coffee grounds are all green materials. They should make up 50% of your compost by volume. The next ingredient needed is water. The pile should be as damp as a wrung out sponge. If you take a handful of compost and squeeze it, the water should barely run out. The fourth ingredient is air, which can be added by turning the compost about once a week. That's where the final ingredient, labor, comes in. But before we touch on that topic, let's talk about the pile's helpers, micro and macro organisms. For example, psychrophilic microorganisms prefer temperature in the 50 to 70 degree range. As those microorganisms start to eat, move around and reproduce, they generate heat. When the pile moves to the 70 to 90 degree range, mesophilic microorganisms take over. Just like the psychrophilic microorganisms, when the temperatures get hotter than the mesophilic microorganisms prefer, they may get consumed by others, die, or move to a colder part of the pile. Once the pile surpasses 90 degrees, thermophilic microorganisms take over. The goal temperature for the pile is between 130 to 140 degrees for three to four weeks. This can be achieved by turning the compost at least once a week. If the temperature stays within that range for a prolonged period of time, 85 to 90 percent of the weed and grass seeds will be destroyed along with some pathogens. In addition to the three types of microorganisms we talked about, there are also fungi-like bacteria called actinomycetes. They have a gray, ashy look, which tricks some into thinking their compost may have caught fire. While you can't see the microorganisms in your compost, there are macroorganisms that you will be able to spot once the temperature cools down. They can include sow bugs, snails, springtails, worms, slugs, and green fruit beetle larvae. These macroorganisms further the decomposition process and make the compost richer. So we've told you what items to add to your compost, like brown and green materials, but there are also substances that you should leave out of your compost. 
They include diseased plants because it's possible the compost will not heat up enough to kill plant diseases, meaning they could be spread to other plants. Similarly, poisonous plants like oleander and invasive plants like Bermuda grass should stay out of your compost. Same thing with plants that have thorns. They often take a very long time to decompose, which means you could get pricked when touching compost with your hands. In addition, leave out green or brown materials that were recently treated with pesticides or fungicides because they can kill the micro and macro organisms. You should also avoid putting dog droppings, meat, fat, bones, dairy products, and oils into compost. So that's the long and short of what should go in your bin or pile and what should stay out. Now let's talk about how to turn those materials into compost. The goal is to have a 50-50 ratio of brown and green material by volume, not weight. Start with a layer of brown material, then a layer of green material, and then add water. Repeat this pattern until the bin is full to the top or you run out of materials. End the pile with a brown layer, then give it one last good soak until the water runs out the bottom of the pile. If you'd like to add food scraps to the compost, bury them one foot deep. It helps reduce food odor and will keep unwanted pests away. Finally, securely cover the compost with a plastic bag, cardboard, newspaper, or a piece of remnant carpet to help maintain moisture levels. Add oxygen by turning weekly. This is where the labor portion of composting comes in. To correctly turn your compost pile, start by removing the weight and whatever cover you're using. A black plastic bag, piece of remnant carpet, cardboard, or newspaper. In our case, a black plastic bag. From there, you'll want to gently loosen the compost from the edges of the bin. Compost has a habit of acting like a jello mold and attaching to the sides of bins, making turning difficult. To remedy this, you can enlist the help of a second person, or in our case, a pitchfork, to help in this process. The goal is to simply pry the compost away from the sides of the bin and loosen things up for the removal. Lift the bin vertically over the pile, making sure it's completely free of compost. Once you've removed the bin, simply place it next to the compost as close as possible to make the most of the space you have. Then it's time to get to work with your pitchfork. Start with the outside edge of the compost and work inward. Transfer the material to the bin, taking time to fluff the compost with the pitchfork to break up any clumps and discourage matting. Compost that used to be on the edges should be moved to the middle, while compost in the middle should be moved to the edges. This will ensure the moisture and heat distribution in your pile is even. At this point, you don't need to worry about layering green and brown material. Everything can be mixed together because the composting process is already underway. Keep a hose handy because every so often, every time four to six inches of material has been added, you'll want to water down the compost. Remember, we're aiming to keep things as wet as a wrung out sponge, or even a little more damp if you're turning your pile for the first few times. From there, keep repeating the process. Take a scoop of compost and fluff it into the bin, adding water as necessary, every four to six inches or so, aiming to achieve that damp as a wrung out sponge consistency. The entire process could take anywhere from 20 to 30 minutes to completely turn the pile. If you want to add in new green or brown material, feel free to deposit it throughout the turning process, but know it will slow down the rate at which you generate finished compost. Once all of the compost has been moved back into the bin, there are two final steps. First, turn the hose back on and give the entire pile one last soak. After that's been completed, return the cover and wait to the top of the bin. Voila! With weekly turning, if everything goes as planned, your pile will heat to 130 to 140 degrees. If you can keep that up for 3 to 4 weeks, you can produce finished compost in 10 to 12 weeks. You can tell it's done when it's dark, crumbly like chocolate cake, smells like fresh damp earth, and looks nothing like the material you started with. What began with a full bin of brown and green material is now just a half or third of finished product. You should have enough to cover a 6 foot square area 3 to 4 inches deep with compost. So how can you utilize compost in your yard? Soil Incorporation is adding the compost to your soil and mixing it together. Mulching is placing the compost on top of the ground and being sure to keep it away from plant stems and tree trunks. Compost tea is a soil amendment made by steeping finished compost in a bucket of water for a day, then using the nutrient-packed liquid to water plants. And that's the start to finish about composting, where the finished product is a lot different than the materials at the start.